right, well, welcome everybody to another episode of the Show Me Reptile Show podcast. Uh, we've got uh, our normal cast characters here, myself, Scott, and Mickey, and we've got a special guest this week, Scott Miller, famous in the Sanboa world. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Yeah, we uh, we kind of like to start off usually. Uh, it, it's a similar story almost every time we ask this, but uh, we like to ask all the guests what what originally got you started into reptiles. How did your your love for these uh, critters get started? Um, well, as a kid, um, always fascinated by dinosaurs. Um, and then when I was uh, three or four. Uh, We were at the Miller Park Zoo in Bloomington, and there was a college intern walking around with uh, his baby boa constrictor, and he let me hold it. And from that point forward, uh, it was just an obsession with snakes. That's cool. What was your your first reptile as a pet? Uh, The first one was a Haitian curly-tailed lizard. Um, which used to be many years ago, a fairly staple pet store lizard. And now they're apparently pretty uncommon. So, um, but that was, that was the first one. And then after that, and then it was the, the jeweled curly tail lizard, the prettier version of that. So I would love to have some of those. Yeah. I mean, now, nowadays it'd be great to be able to get those again and the numbers they, you know, they used to have and try and breed and stuff, but. You know. That's the crazy thing. That's why people need to work with stuff that's being imported because one day it's just going to disappear. It'll disappear. They won't let it out or in again. And yeah, it'll just, it'll be no longer be there for anyone that's interested. Like um, plated lizards are another one. The Sudan plated lizards, they used to be everywhere. And uh, now they're few and far between, it seems like. so. Now those things are awesome looking little armored tanks. Yeah. It- it's the tale of the $20 lizard. I mean, they come in for hot and heavy for years and then they're just, they're not allowed to come in anymore. And, you know, we, we lose them as a hobby because nobody wants to take the time or put the effort into working with them. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. They feel like there's just an endless stream of them coming in for 20 bucks. So why bother breeding them? If I can just buy them for 20 and flip them for 40. Pretty much. I mean, I'm breeding Emerald Swifts. <laughs> That's cool, though. Yeah. I'm breeding amoebas right now. Really? There you go. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Scott. So, Scott, then what What helped you, like, what was the progression that took it from, you know, an obsession and, and something that you like to keep as a pet to uh, the point that you decided, hey, I'm going to try breeding these? What was the first thing that you bred? Uh, the first thing I actually bred was a pair of, of Kenyan Samboas. Um, I got as adults from a guy at the uh, Lee Watson uh, Reptile Swap in Streamwood, Illinois, 30-something years ago. And he he uh, talked to me about how to cycle them and everything like that. And um, those were the first snakes I successfully bred. I actually got to see her give birth to everything. Um watched them come out of the the sack and take their first breaths and it was just just amazing so so did you have anybody that uh that kind of mentored you along the way or was it kind of more of a self-experimenting no i had i had a couple people um i was lucky enough that um at the time dave Sorensen, who used to work at the milwaukee zoo um was a regular at um lee watson's show and he is one of the very first, um, not only Sanboa breeders, but he actually did studies on them in the wild, like with Russians um, and some of the other ones. And so he was really probably the biggest influence on me because I could go every every month or every or twice a month and talk to him about different species and, and care and feeding and, and setups and everything. And then... You know, when some of the, the that at that time stuff would come in at, and it was always labeled, quote unquote, Russians, I could, you know, take them to the to the show and have him identify him correctly and stuff. And it was just um, it, it was so beneficial to have that um, and, and to have someone that like just would sit there and put up with all of my endless questions and um, 
just, you know, constant curiosity. And it was, it was I'm so grateful to have had that experience when I first got into them. Um, I also would talk to um, Mark Bell quite a bit about breeding. Um, Lloyd Lemke a few times, numerous times, actually, I talked to him back in those days. Um, John Melter is another one that uh, put up with all of my uh, constant barrage of, of questions and stuff. Um, and uh, actually at that time too, Brian Barczyk was a regular at Lee Watson's show. Um, him and a guy that used to work at the tables with him would, you know, con you know, have to put up with me constantly, always asking about stuff and whatnot. So I had a, a lot of, a lot of really knowledgeable people helping me when I got started. So well, that's awesome. I think we're all, all fortunate. I, in uh, you know, disclosure, I, I've been in San Boas for about, you know, seven, eight years, actually going on nine years now. And Scott helped me a lot with, uh, I turned the tables on him and bugged him with tons of questions. When I first started as well. So. Bless you. Uh, bless you, Mickey. Um, so when you, when you got started with the San Boas, what at that point in time, was it pretty much just normals only? Yep. It was, basically normals um anneries first popped up um at that time a few years later the albinos and snows um the paradox the first paradox albino was imported about that time um but yeah basically it was just normals um so like you know at one point i had a large collection of just lots of variation and normals which you know, to me, it was still very exciting because no two look alike and you can get, you know, all kinds of color and pattern variations with them. So um, it was still exciting. But then, you know, occasional like being able to get Russians or Javelins or Tartars, um, even Indians and Rough Scales sometimes, you know, would add to it. But with Kenyans, yeah, it was it was just normals for the most part at that time. You know, was it was it the Bells that brought a lot of that stuff in as far as the morphs coming in or? Um, the first anneries were produced, um, nearly simultaneously, if I remember right, by Mark Bell and, um, I think it's the gen the gentleman that, that runs the bean farm. I can't think his name off the top of my head. Um, and then the first paradox albino was brought in by Dave and Tracy Barker. Um, and I believe they brought, uh, brought in some of the first Dodomas and Dodoma flames, um, and then, um, uh, the albino, the first albino was, albinos were produced by Mark Bell from, an, uh, what was supposedly an albino from the Egyptian locale. So he had the first albinos. Um, uh, so those, those are, that's, that's what I remember about where some of the first ones came from. Gotcha. And I know uh, one of the uh, things that you kind of pioneered that uh, nobody else had really done beforehand was uh, crossing the Kenyans and the Rufessans. How did how did that come apart or how did you get your first Rufessans and, and what made you want to go that route? Um, I got some pure Rufessans, um, some pures and crosses from uh, Brian Emanuel. Um he had the one and only original pair of pure Rufessans that have ever been imported into the United States. Um, and um, so I got some, some of those and started making stripes and, and wanting to cross, cross other morphs into the stripes. Um, and the first one I did was, was the Anry stripe. Um, Cause the Anry is one of my favorite morphs, just the black and white, the contrast is just, it looks so good with anything. So, um, and then a few years later, the um, Paradox Albino Stripes, I produced the first ones of um, from a very high expression line of Paradox Albino that, that I work with. Um, and that's, that's, I don't know if I like those better than the Henry Stripes, but it's pretty close. So. Yeah, they're pretty impressive animals. So then at, the, at that time... Um, I know there's been there was a lot of discussion or argument back and forth if Rufessens was was just like a different locale or completely different species of sand boa. Now I guess everybody kind of assumes that's uh, it's essentially a hybrid animal combining the two, but it's, um, it's more well accepted in the sand boa world. 
it seems to be by most people, um, they actually were reclassified because you used to have uh, Kenyans, which were the colorblindness lover jai. You had Egyptians, which were colorblindness, colorblindness, and then you had the Rufessans, which were um, Eryx or Gondolophus Rufessans, and then um, Tokar is the name. He reclassified everything and put them all in the same group. So now we just have Colubrinus. Um, but anybody I kn I've ever known over the years that's worked with pure Rufessans, everyone seems to agree that they are a, and should be a separate species because they're not like Kenyans or even Egyptians. They don't reach the same size. They don't have the same head shape. The eye placement is different. Um, the eye size is different compared to the head size. Um, it's, it's just, they're, they're completely different. Um, so I, any more technically, I guess they can't be considered a hybrid because they all got reclassified as the same species, but it, they use, they were considered a crossbreed for a very long time. Um, I, I think the term hybrid more pertains to two different species. Yeah. Um, but I, but they would, they would definitely still be considered crossbreeds. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I, um, with, without having crossed them, we wouldn't have a lot of the cool stuff that we do, like the stripes and the granites and the patternless and stuff. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like breeding a rough scale to a Kenyan, you know, which as far as I know has never actually been successfully done. I know people have tried, but. Um, yeah, it is. It is so odd. With the you, you put the refrescents and the Kenyan together, and you get just about fifty percent stripes. But yet, if you put two stripes together, there's no guarantee you're going to get a hundred percent stripe. So it clearly, exactly. yeah, clearly is not a you know, plain old uh, you know recessive trait. No, there's obviously something different going on there, and two different two different snakes. Yeah, um, there are occasionally animals that will produce. Um, and I, I believe it's usually with males that will produce 100% striped litters no matter what you breed them with, which I I guess sometimes people refer to as a super stripe, but it's I don't know if I would really call it a super stripe. Um, it's just an, an animal that has, you know, the ability to produce all striped babies. Um, you know, so I don't, I don't know what a better term would be for that, but super stripe kind of is a little misleading, I think. Um, yeah, people start thinking of it in terms of some of the supers and ball pythons, and it's definitely yeah. not that at all. No, uh-uh. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the rough scales, and not nearly as many people that work with, with the rough scales. I know you're one of them that produces you know, several litters each year. Um, for the people out there that don't know anything about them, tell them what kind of you know, separates them a little bit more from the Kenyans. Um, the main thing is, um, like with Kenyans, you have like the back third of the body, the scales are, are rough and keeled with, with rough scales, the entire body is like that. Um, so that would probably be the most obvious difference. Um, they come from a different area. Um, they're from like India, Pakistan, um, and that geographical region. Um, but other than that, you know, other than they're, you know, they're pretty much, you know, as far as like captive care it is pretty much identical. Um, they seem to have a lot more of natural wild type variation than Kenyans from what I've seen of natural history photos and stuff. But that could also just be the limitation of the photos that are out there too. But rough scales have quite a bit of variety of like natural wild type appearances. Um, and there's, there's some really neat looking ones and there's even al albinos that are out there. So um, yeah, I've seen the photos, never seen anything live on the albino side, but I, I don't know if we ever will, unfortunately, but they're, they're out there. They're definitely really cool. So, yeah. And as far as those go, you have, uh, like some caramels, don't you, that you work with? Yeah. Um, a line, um, me and the gentleman that started it, we kind of dubbed it caramel hypo because it's got a very re reduced black and it's mostly shades of light cream and, and soft brown. Although some of them do get some really nice red through them and stuff. And I'm hoping this year to have a uh, fourth generation litter of those. So I'm excited to That'd see what awesome. those might look like. So, 
So out outside of the sandball world, what else do you keep? Anything else that you breed regularly or stuff that you keep just as pets? Um, Longicata boas are my other favorite. Um, it's probably, it's the only locality boa that I keep. It's probably my favorite quote unquote boa constrictor. Um, just because of the variation with them and the way they change over the first three or so years of their life from, from very dark gray plain to, you know, e either you know, jet black or golden, golden yellow and black. There's a lot of variation. Those are probably my favorite. I've got a few um, like Nicaraguan and Central American boa morphs, um, the Burke T positive albino and IMG. Um, I have type one anery Nicaraguans, which I don't think hardly anyone works with those anymore um, that I've seen. Um, I think they're really cool. Um, they've become a lot less popular because there's a type two anery, which has a little bit more contrast. Um, and then I've got uh, some lychee geckos, crested geckos, chihua geckos. Um, I've got a pair of gidgey skinks now that I'm raising. Those are a lot of fun and a lot of a lot of interesting behaviors to watch and to work with. So that's cool. If you, uh, as, as far as the uh, the stuff that you work with or that you that you sell at the shows, what would you say is like your your big sales pitch? You know, if somebody comes up and asks why they should own a sand boa or why they should own. Uh, a Nicaraguan. What what are what are your reasons behind those, and why those species are a draw for you? Uh, for sand boas, um, it's it, the ease of maintenance with them. They're very easy to keep. The demands, the care demands, are very low. They're fairly indestructible, and they're fairly tolerant of keeper error, which is important for new people because you know we all make mistakes when we're starting out, and you know, even with lots of experience, we can still make a, mis a mistake. So, um, the Samboas are very, fairly tolerant of that and forgiving. Um, uh, Nicaraguan boas, um, their small size is a big plus. Most of my adults are in the three to four and a half foot range. So they don't, um, take up as much space as like a Colombian. They don't require as, as much, um, feeding or or cage space um and same with the longicatas they're they're not as small as the nicaraguan they're a little bit bigger but they still don't require the spacious caging that a colombian does and they don't reach the large size and the heavy weight that they do either that's cool and how long do you say you said it's been about 30 years that you've been in with samboas um i think i'm pushing 34 or 35 yeah, I think I'm pushing 33 or 34 now years with sand boas. Um, a very long time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a long time to watch you watch people come and go and new and new morphs come in and out and you know, combinations be invented. It's got to be exciting to to see where it's come from. Just a a handful um, of normals in the beginning. It is. It's it's been very exciting, and and not even just with sand boas, but with everything else. You know. The, the way things have grown and changed over the years, it's, it's just, it's, it's fascinating and it's exciting to be a part of. Yeah. I know we've had you know some people on talking about how, you know, when they first got started, you know, obviously there was no online forums. There weren't, you know, gigantic shows like, you know, like a Tinley or anything. And you literally were ordering a snake based off of a drawing that you saw in a magazine. Yeah. You know, pretty much. You got what you got. Just about, yeah. I mean, you could, no matter how many questions you asked a, a, a dealer or, you know, how much specifics you requested, you, you were going to get what you were going to get, and you had to be happy with it. So. You didn't get yeah. 20 pictures? Uh, nope, didn't even get one most of the time. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just making jokes. No, I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> nope, you got, a, you got a price list in the mail. <laughs> Uh, or you called them out of the back of a magazine and you hope for the best. So, yeah, no, no overnight emergency shipping with, you know, heat packs and all of that stuff. I'm the, sure. the USPS was very, very gentle with the uh, boxes that were sent. Uh, <laughs> you, yeah. And, and you were, you were lucky if they put newspaper in it for padding and insulation sometimes, no matter what time of the year it was. It, um, well, We'll check in. We'll check. I know, uh, Mickey, you've been down in Springfield. You said uh, we're getting close to uh, opening our fourth location down there, right? Yeah. Hey, tell us yeah. How, that's, how that's coming along, what the anticipation is. 
Oh man, everybody's so excited, but uh, we've got animals in here acclimating now and uh, kind of training the, some of the staff members up on how we we do things and stuff like that. A lot of fun. What what targeted or what made you want to go into the Springfield area? Uh, well, the goal is to put a, a store everywhere I have a show, so to support that local community in between shows. So. Yeah, and that we'll show down everywhere. there has, has grown massively. One of our one of our biggest shows now, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's been one of our best shows for years. We just don't talk about it a lot because we don't want to fill it up with, you know, a ton of vendors. But it's it's usually pretty good. And uh, so, what's the, the target <laughs> open date down there? You said. Uh, next Wednesday, whatever the day is. Next Wednesday, I don't know. Twenty fifth, twenty sixth. Gotcha. And what would what would you say, you know, from from our standpoint, what sets our shops apart from from some other places? Uh well, you know, they're they're pretty clean. We got a wide variety of animals. Uh, yeah, I think one of the big things is we we source our animals pretty much exclusively from our shows and from those vendors. So we're not picking up from massive wholesalers or anything like that. All of our animals we can hand pick out to supply our shops with. Uh, from, yeah, which from people that we can see, the circle of life. Yeah, it yeah. helps that they're all all vendors and breeders that we see week in and week out, and we know we can trust where the the stock is coming from. Yeah, Scott, what do we got coming up on the on the show front? If you want to kind of recap what we did last weekend and what's coming up over the next couple of weeks. Let's see, last weekend was Jacksonville, Florida. We had Shelbyville. Was that it last weekend? I think it was I think it. That's all we had. Two. We said two shows last weekend. Yeah. This weekend coming up, I'm going, doing a double header, doing Cape Girardeau, Missouri, then headed straight to Tulsa the following day. And then Mickey is going to be in Atlanta, and Sam's mm-hmm. going to be in Florida. What, Tampa? Yeah, we got. I got to make sure I send Sam with some sunscreen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's got the mullet. It, it covers pretty uh covers pretty well on the back end. I, th- I think Florida's going to love Sam. Oh, yeah. The mullet alone's going to get him very far there. I think I think him and Jimmy will do well down there this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, and you said the uh, – I noticed the the response to the ad for that Tulsa show is going kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Tulsa is a, is a very good market. There's a lot of demand for our shows down there. Um, our, I think our biggest lacking point is just vendors in that area. Uh, we have a lot of ball python breeders down there um, and not a whole lot else in that area. So getting some more vendors to travel to the area. I think Mickey said we got uh, JJ coming up this show, possibly. I think JJ is coming up. Yeah. So she, yeah, she used to the show a bunch and she's got uh, some awesome selection of frogs. So I'll kind of split it up a little bit. Um, you know, tell us one of my favorite shows to do. So we can just regrow it to what it once was. I think it's going to be awesome if we get some more vendors down there. And I know, uh, Mickey, we just had a uh, recent uh, change by one weekend, what, on the on the Virginia Beach show? We yeah, so we're, we're, back to the first, we're back to the first weekend in August for Virginia Beach. So if you haven't yet, sign up, because we are going to restrict that show down to about, I'm going to keep it at about 180, 200 tables. Uh, we can do three, 350 there, but I think keeping it 200, you know, that way everybody has a good show. I think that's more important than packing the venue full of vendors. Yeah, that was a blast last year. I mean, just that whole area is so nice. Incredible seafood. The The venue was unbelievable. It's it's a really good time. Uh, I was talking to Vanessa with US Art. She's going to come out there to that show, and we're going to run some silent auctions and maybe do a live auction uh, that Saturday night. <clears throat> and uh yeah it was a really good really good show and it was a really good time last year uh so i think we're we're gonna be set up for another good good show there this year too and that one uh, that just that whole area just makes like a nice it's kind of like a, a a good vacation plan you know you can go there spend a few days in virginia beach have a great time and then oh by the way there's a there's a kick-ass reptile show going on at the same time 
Yeah, not only that, the state's still very lax on the laws. So, I mean, you can get your beach vacation without having to go to Florida and deal with FWC and all that stuff. So, yeah. That's, so, your animal guard uh, could get murdered right there on the spot? No. <laughs> yeah, and that's uh, FWC is now, it seems like they're showing up more and more at the shows, too. <laughs> Like, her, no, don't want to say harassing, but going table to table to check everything. I'm I'm always happy to see state officials at the show because it's an opportunity for us to kind of bridge the gap yeah. and, you know, help educate them and they can educate us. You know, we can kind of see where each other's coming from in these situations. Like a lot of times the, the uh, agents that are coming out to the shows, you know, they don't want to come out there. It's the weekend. They would rather be at home doing something else. You know, they don't want to be out at the shows. But, you know, in, in a lot of places, they just want to make sure everybody's got their licensing and then they're following the rules. And I mean, it's really that simple. All you got to do is follow some, some rules and, you know, but I don't know. I can go on about this all day. Just the more people break rules, the more rules they're going to make for it. Stop breaking the rules. <laughs> yep, definitely. Scott, that's one you should you should make that trip. You need to you need to vend in uh, Virginia Beach. Is that where's where's the Virginia Beach at? I can't. It's a it's a haul all the way out there on the on the East Coast, but uh, the the venue's amazing. And, oh really? Uh, yeah, it's big. It, it it almost kind of resembles the atrium, like going into Tinley Park. It's a not quite that big because we don't have both sides of it, but it's a you know, massive massive show. Oh wow! Is that once a year? Or? Yeah, yeah, just once a year in in August. Oh, okay, I'll definitely keep that in mind for this year then. Well, Scott or Mickey, did you guys have any any other questions for Scott about sand boas or or his reptiles? I mean, the Gigi skinks. How how's that breeding project going? Um, they're young right now. Um, okay, but they're growing very fast. Um. I, I kind of like to get younger stuff and raise it. Um, I've just always enjoyed raising stuff up from, from youngsters. Um, but they're, they're growing very fast. They eat a lot more than I would expect a lizard of their size right now to, to be able to eat. Um, but they're, you know, I'm hoping in a couple of years, they'll be big enough to, to cycle and breed. Um, they're just, they're just really fun. They'll like, I keep them in the room where I have my gecko. So if I'm in there doing stuff with the geckos, they'll, they'll kind of sit and watch me. Um, you know, they'll come out when I, when I drop food in the, in the tank, they're, they're not shy. Like some of the other animals are and stuff. So, um, I'm looking forward to producing some cause they, you know, they live in family groups. They're, they're not a, usually not aggressive towards each other. Um, from what I've read, um, I think they're just going to be a lot of fun to, to have around different than you know sand boas. so yeah the sand but, boas are awesome but they're not the most exciting pet to look at not always no not always unfortunately so yeah but sometimes they have funny little attitudes that that um that is very true how old do the uh Gidgees have to be before they breed typically uh i think two or three from what i've been able to find so Mine are, mine are still young. They were just born like late last year, I believe. So I've got, I've got some time with them. But that's pretty cool, though. I, I do love that the idea of anything that you can actually, you know, cohab and raise in a community like that is awesome. Yeah, just the interactions and stuff just makes keeping them a lot more exciting. So yeah, communal lizards are my favorite. Yeah, I really enjoy watching them just be natural, you know, with each other. Yeah, everyone everyone shits on my my emerald swifts and how they're kind of boring cheap lizards, but they're they're right there on my office desk because there's six of them there running around chasing each other and they're fun to watch. Scott, how's the uh, how's the lizards? What'd you say, Mickey? I said that's what I like about my keel lizards. They're fun to watch. Yeah. Scott, how's your frog army building up? Still got a lot of tadpoles. Had them slowly kind of peeking out, emerging here and there. So my uh, my yellow my yellow spotted climbing toad males getting closer to maturity. So once once he goes, that's going to be an adventure. That's cool. I've got so, three. I've got three females waiting for him. So as soon as he's ready, he's gonna 
He's going to be a popular man soon. Yeah. Like 2,000 eggs at a time, so that's going to be interesting to, to go after. Yeah. Wow. Um, you really will have the entire basement full of frogs. Yeah. Well, and the the toadlets eat like springtails. They're that small, so it's going to be oh, an exciting wow. little uh, time for me. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Well, Scott Miller, is there anything else on uh, anything else on your horizon? Any any species that you always wish you could keep, or things that you're looking towards or trying to find? Um, I mean, not not really. Um, I you know I I kind of the sambos are what I enjoy, are what I enjoy working with the most. Um, so I'm pretty content just to to keep on with those and you know try and create different you know pattern combinations and color morphs and stuff like that so okay. so anything in particular this season that you're expecting to make uh something new or exciting or just you know a, a repeat litter that you're expecting to see again this year um i'm, ho I'm hoping for um some more uh paradox splash stuff this year um I'm also trying for uh, a few different species that I haven't produced in, in a number of years, um, like javelins, um, sunset Indians, and I'm really hoping for success with my Persians this year. Um, I, I've tried and tried with those, and I just don't seem to have the luck with them. But this year, things are going better, so I've got my finger crossed for those. So. That's cool. Those Persians are really deceptive. In photos, they don't look like much, but in person, they're they're beautiful when you can see the uh, pattern. They're they're much more impressive in person for sure. Yeah. And then I guess obviously they must uh, they don't follow the same breeding season as the Kenyans, where it's nice and easy to figure out when you can throw them together. Um. No, they don't follow the same you know general season and cycling rules. They also mature a lot slower than the Kenyans do. Um, you know, males will still usually breed it, you know, two, you know, two years, three years old. Females usually take five to six before they want to breed. Um, so it's, it, you have to have a lot more patience to, to work with the Indians and the Persians. That makes sense. Uh, the Russians are kind of the same way. You can, they, they, they have a fast appetite, but especially because they brew mate, you know, compared to the others. They just don't grow as fast and they don't mature as fast. I've noticed that as well. They more like four, five, six years old. Whereas the Kenyans, I know some people have had them ready to go in, you know, year three. I don't recommend that, but you no. know, like, the Russians definitely don't get there anywhere near that quickly. No. Even javelins take a good four years before they're really ready. So, um, it's really good just to be patient with all the stuff that you breed and just give them time to grow. Like everybody always seems like they're in a race to like, Oh, I got to breed my ball Python in 18 months. Like just let them grow up and live their lives a little bit, you know? That's, that's very true. We, we, we as humans have put a lot of, um, you know, <clears throat> like weight and size requirements that, you know, if the animals could talk, they would probably tell us that we were just completely wrong about all of that. Um, and, and instead of researching and studying more of like, you know, when do they mature and breed in the wild? It's okay. When can we get them mature and breed them in captivity? And, and I, I think a lot of what we've done is, is rush things way too much. So. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of that sadly comes the, the, the ball Python world. You know, it's so competitive when, a, you know, some new morph comes out or some new combo comes out that everybody's just racing to try to maximize what they can get back on their investment quickly. And that's that's a shame when it starts being about the money more than it is about the animal. And it, you know, forces people to, to, to push an animal's limits before it's really truly ready. And I think uh, I've noticed it anything in the past that I've ever bred as far as like the Kenyans, especially if you breed them on the small side. You can almost guarantee the next year you're not going to be able to breed them again. They're going to need a full year or two years to recover. Uh, so I've just gotten to the point now where I don't care if it says three years and 300 grams. I'm just I'm not even going to bother. I'm going to wait an extra year on anything beyond what the, the minimums are. And and I notice they bounce back a lot quicker. And that first litter is larger. And, and especially the rebound is so much stronger. 
Yeah. So Mickey, you got anything else you want to say about the about the shows upcoming or about the shops or, or anything here before we wrap it up? Uh yeah, we've got some new coordinators that we're gonna be working on training here in the next couple weeks. Uh you know, we're <clears throat> really working on recreating our team and and getting uh just building a lot of positivity within the shows and stuff. Uh I know everybody is tired of hearing about marketplace is almost done, but we're getting ready to launch. I think it's pretty sure it should launch next week. So, uh, super excited about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot going on. We got a couple of new show locations that we're getting ready to, to, uh, launch as well. Uh, you know, in, in their own markets away from everybody else. So those are going to be super cool. And, uh, we've got, uh, an announcement hopefully we'll be making within the next couple of weeks with Clint Bartley about Bluebird Fest, uh, finalizing some details on that. That's going to be a lot of fun. But, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff going on. I'm super busy. As you can tell, I'm getting bags under my eyes and gray hairs. So. <laughs> I think Will that's there all be of us. Venom Fest, do you think? Another Venom Fest? So I think I'm... I think I might try to do Venom Fest again. I'm going to find a more remote area to do it in. Okay. Because we just caught nothing but drama up here in the St. Louis area from a local uh, reptile club. Mm. And, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to doing it again. But the, the thing that I want to do with it this time is, and, and it was the purpose that you know, the whole reason I started was to emphasize on education and getting the venomous community together. And then it turned more into a focus on the show. Right. So the next time I do it, it's going to be more emphasis on education and getting venomous keepers together and maybe doing a show on Sunday, you know, oh. just have a one day show and, you know, kind of how we're setting Bluebird Fest up. I, I, I think I, I really enjoy doing stuff like that because the primary purpose of doing all this is after all education. Right. So, it, it, and I just let it go the wrong direction, just letting it turn strictly into a show. So, I, I think I want to try it again next year. Cool. Very cool. That's cool. When is the, the, the target for Colubrid Fest? Uh, we're shooting for the last weekend of September. Uh, just this venue, dealing with this venue is very, uh, well, if anybody knows anything about dealing with venues, they're a pain in the butt, so... <clears throat> yeah, everyone's different and has their own different set of rules. Oh yeah, some people like to make up the rules as they go too. So <laughs> that's cool. I noticed yeah, that at the St. Louis show we had just tons of outreach staff there. From you know that you sent a lot of the the folks over from the shops to to help out with education and and introduction to a lot of the new folks walking through the door. Well, so that that was kind of their training day. So what we're doing with a lot of the store employees. Uh, you know, there's a lot of events going on, you know, in the areas where there's stores. So, uh, you know, the stores are paying these people to go out and, and do education at these events, you know, so we can do reptile education to the public because I don't get to do that stuff anymore. So, Gotcha. And Scott, you have any updates as far as shows go or still still ongoing need for coordinators? Um, yeah, we can still use a couple more, you know, we've hired a couple here in the last couple of weeks, you know, of course, most folks have other jobs too. So their schedules don't allow them to work every weekend all the time. So we could always use more. I got, um, somebody, um, kind of going to trial run this weekend with me in Cape Girardeau. So hopefully everything works out well with him and, um, yeah, just keep chugging along. So if anyone's interested, get after me or Mickey and see where we can start you up. I've got Amy going with me to Atlanta this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be fun. That's cool. And those, uh, a lot of you are probably already watching this on uh, our YouTube channel, but for anybody who happens across it and is not already a subscriber, uh, we are doing a $250 cash giveaway to one of our subscribers. It'll be drawn on June 1st. So uh, you want to make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel before the end of May. And if you do, you'll be in the drawing automatically. So uh, that'll be courtesy of Mickey. Uh, we the, the channel started to really pick up and grow uh, when we kind of re-energized this. We only had 200 and change. We're we're actually starting to knock on the door, getting 900, 
So we're we're hoping to cross over a thousand followers here in the in the next week or so, and uh, that's just you know, one one more reason to make sure that you follow. But we've got more videos okay. and. and uh, uh, we've got guests scheduled for the podcast for the next three weeks, so it looks like this is going to be on and rolling on a weekly basis. Yeah, we'll see where I'm at next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mickey might be building out a new store somewhere, just randomly got halfway home and decided to stop and build a shop. Sounds about right. Well, all right. Well, I think uh, that's it. Uh, Scott, thank you so much for, for being here and being a guest this week. We appreciate uh, being able to pick your mind and you sharing some of the, uh, the Sandbo stuff with us. I've got the photos that you sent over, so I will, uh, when I edit the, the the show here, we'll put those up and let people see some of the beautiful animals that you create. But we appreciate you coming on. And, oh, yeah, thank I look you, forward to seeing you soon. It was thank good seeing you. Me. Good to see you guys, too. And uh, one one quick thing, Scott, if you want to shout out um, where where people can find you uh, as far as your your socials or web page or anywhere where they can take a look at your animals that you have available for sale or just uh, to check out what you work with. Um, I've got a the Facebook page is just under my name, Scott Miller. Um, and then I have a I don't have much up now, but I do have a, a morph market store. Sanbo is by Scott Miller. Um, kind of need to get a few more things put up there, but um it, it it's not as easy as it used to be to get stuff up on there. So just uh, just hold on a week, Scott, and load it up. On <laughs> It'll be fine. You know, yeah. I've, been, I, I've been waiting. So yeah, when when that's right, I'm, I'm looking forward to that, I really am. So and Mickey, didn't you say we're doing for first month or first two months free? First two months are free, and then for Show Me Vendors, it's only going to be twenty bucks a month after that, and all that money's just going in to pay the web team and for marketing. So, uh, yeah gonna market the shit out of marketplace <laughs> looking forward to it all right well that's awesome i think that'll wrap it up everybody thanks again scott we appreciate you being with us and we'll see thank you, guys you. next week thanks scott thank you have a good you're welcome bye